Well, hello everyone. I'm J.D. Harrington, Public Affairs Officer for NASA's Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate and headquarters here in D.C. I'd like to welcome you to today's news conference. We'll talk about NASA Aeronautics Research Portfolio. We'll talk about the President's fiscal year 2017 budget, plus what that enables us to do over the next 10 years. We have uh, also a uh, special announcement that we're kind of excited about. Uh, we also have three panelists that are going to join us today. Each one will give brief remarks. We'll give the announcement that we just talked about, and then we'll open it up to question and answers. This presentation will last no more than an hour. Today's panelists include Charlie Bolden, NASA Administrator from NASA Headquarters in Washington, D.C. We also have Jay Wan Shin, the Associate Administrator of NASA's Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate, also in D.C., as well as David Melcher, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Aerospace Industries Association out of Arlington, Virginia. And with that, we'll call up Charlie. Charlie? First of all, let me thank all of you for coming out, uh, particularly our industry partners and friends. Uh, I had a chance to meet some that I have not had an opportunity to meet before, so I, hopefully we will, we will get to see a lot more of each other. And for those of you from the media, uh, just come on up and you know, feel free to ask questions later, not right now. Um, I, I do want to say how happy I am to be here. I, I don't think there's a better um, place, a better venue than to be right here at, at Reagan National Airport today for, for what we're about to, to talk about. Um, I, personally, I love leap years, and um, you know, since this is leap day, um, I think the reason I like leap years so much is because uh, NASA's always talking about taking giant leaps to benefit humankind. So what a, what a more appropriate day than leap day of leap year to talk about what we're going to talk about today. I think some of you who have heard me before know that I'm a big person uh, when it comes to talking about the first A in NASA, the, and I call it the big A in NASA. Um, our heritage is, is aviation and aeronautics. And sometimes people forget that uh, in the hubbub of always talking about human space flight and, and our incredible science uh, advancements. But we really want to have everybody focus today on the heart and soul of what, what NASA's heritage is, and that's aviation. I truly believe that 2016 is going to be a tremendous year for giant leaps. And, and, and I say this in terms of aviation, which we're here to discuss today, as well as space exploration and our journey to Mars, but we're not going to talk, talk about that today. I'm joined today by Dr. J. Wan Chin, NASA's Associate Administrator for Aeronautics Research, and by David Melcher, the CEO of Aerospace Industries Association, or AIA. We're here today to talk about NASA's work to make flight cleaner, greener, safer, and quieter, all while developing aircraft that travel faster and building an aviation system that operates more efficiently. There's a certain excitement about being able to discuss the future of flight with this wonderful airport, DCA, as a backdrop. People from all walks of life and all corners of the globe surround us as they head down to the security gate. And I told them when we were walking up, I said, well, I sure hope you haven't put us in line with the security gates because the last thing we want to do on this big day is to have people go wherever they're going and complain about NASA blocking traffic. So uh, I'm glad to see we're down in a, in a nice safe corner. Every time the folk here with us today take off and land, they're contributing to some 1.5 trillion, and that's trillion with a T, in economic activity that's fueled by American aviation. Of course, each takeoff and landing represents more than just dollars and cents. It represents families with food on the table, thanks to the 12 million jobs supported by American aviation. It represents businesses connecting with businesses in a world that's growing smaller and smaller by the day, thanks to aviation. It represents old friends being reunited. And as a grandparent, that means grandparents like me attending the wedding of a grandchild a patient waiting an organ, an entrepreneur shipping out the very first batch of new products, scientists traveling to collaborate, and diplomats, especially from this place, working to bring peace to our troubled world. With so much riding on the wings of our aircraft, we at NASA take our responsibility very seriously. 
I am so proud of our employees, contractors, and partners whose work is why we're able to say with all sincerity, NASA is with you when you fly. They and their predecessors are the reason why every U.S. aircraft and U.S. air traffic control tower has NASA developed technologies on board. Now, I'm not the only one who has a lot of faith in the ingenuity and ability of NASA people. President Barack Obama has made a very bold statement about the respect and belief he has in NASA's work. The President is calling for a new $3.7 billion investment in green aviation. That's in NASA, a $3.7 billion investment in green aviation, and that's over the next 10 years. That's, that's in a very real sense, it's also an investment in each and every one of us. I would argue that every American is poised to benefit from some way in this investment because all of us have a stake in breathing cleaner air or living in a country where more and more of our neighbors are working in stable, well-paying jobs. As our climate continues to change, we all have a stake in building a future where we fly on aircraft that consume half as much fuel, that generate only one quarter of current emissions, and that make use of greener energy sources in the first place. With global air passenger traffic projected to double over the next couple decades, it's best for all of us that we find new ways to absorb billions of new passengers without compromising the safety of our skies. Every American has a stake in bringing about a future where our airports are better neighbors because aircraft operate as much as 42 decibels quieter. And therefore, the noise at airports like DCA, IAD or Dulles, and BWI is contain contained within the airport's boundaries. A future where people can travel to most cities in the world in six hours or less in an airplane that flies faster than the speed of sound over land with hardly a hint of a sonic boom. If all this sounds like science fiction, well, that's why I like to say that the people of NASA turn science fiction into science fact and that we make the impossible possible. The President's proposal would allow Team NASA to do just that, from aviation energy efficiency to a transformation of propulsion systems to improvements in aviation mobility. This investment will allow us to make giant new leaps. I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention that our researchers projected even before this investment that we could save the commercial airline industry as much as 255 billion, and that's with a B billion, over 25 years through the green aviation technologies NASA is helping develop. Just think of what we'll be able to do for our economy with the additional resources the President is proposing. With this in mind, I want to highlight one of the exciting things that the President's proposal will allow us to propel forward, partnering with industry to build a series of experimental aircraft or X-planes. And let me tell you, any of you have kids in college who want to be engineers, just out of curiosity? Um, it, it is, in, for J1 and me, who go to colleges and, and campuses around the country, this year has been incredibly rewarding to go to a place like Georgia Tech or MIT or the University of Maryland and be able to tell a young man or a young woman that they ought to think about coming into aeronautical engineering because there is definitely a future there because we're getting ready to do new and exciting things and we can actually tell them that we're about to get more money into research uh, on their campuses so that their professors can be involved in that research and they have somebody to mentor them on real research, not just theoretical stuff, but on real research and building airplanes. And that's what I think is so exciting about the President's budget and the idea of NASA getting back into the X-plane business. Along these lines, I have an exciting announcement to make. Nearly 70 years since Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier in the Bell X-1 as part of the NACA's high-speed research, today NASA is awarding a $20 million preliminary design contract for a low-boom flight demonstrator aircraft to a team led by the Lockheed Martin Aeronautics Company in California, which also includes GE Aviation in Ohio and TriModels Incorporated also in the Golden State. 
This first X-plane will be called Quest for quiet supersonic technology. And here's the magical part. The design is for a piloted test aircraft that can fly at supersonic speeds but create a sonic boom that's more like a soft thump instead of the annoying boom that currently prohibits commercial supersonic flight over land. In scientific and technical terms, I, I think that's what they call a big deal. So I'm excited. And perhaps the best news of all is that this is just the beginning. So, you know, with that in mind, I'm gonna ask Dave Melcher and Jaywan Shen to come up and uh, help me unveil an artist rendering of the, the, low, the, the low boom supersonic demonstrator. And then I will turn the podium over to Dr. Shen, who's gonna give you real details about what we're talking about. So Jaywan and David. Great, thank you so much, Charlie. And um, I want to also add uh, welcome, my welcome to uh, everyone who uh, took a uh, time out of busy schedule and uh, be here. For people like me, uh, who really loves loves uh, airplane, this is home. <laughs> this is a beautiful airport, and I'm glad there are some actually some uh, airplanes uh, in the background. Um, but uh, again, I want to thank uh, my uh, boss, Administrator Charlie uh, Borden, for uh, the, uh, the amazing, uh, exciting remarks. And um, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to congratulate uh, Lockheed Martin for this uh, award. And NASA looks forward to uh, working with uh, Lockheed Martin to achieve a successful preliminary design of the world's first uh, quiet uh, supersonic X-plane, and you, you saw the uh, uh, concept there. And just imagine uh, several years down the road uh, that that picture there starts flying over uh, Chicago in uh, Los Angeles, and then people can, uh, and hopefully people cannot hear <laughs> or didn't even know that uh, supersonic airplane just flew by over their heads. That's the objective. So I'm honored and privileged uh, to represent the hardworking men and women of the NASA Aeronautics family and also our partners in industry, uh, academia, and government. Uh, NASA has made uh, significant contributions to aviation. And as you can see out uh, the window, um, I'm glad that uh, all of the airplanes out there actually have winglets uh, <laughs> that uh, a small uh, spike uh, a piece at the tip of the wing that reduced the drag and uh, save uh, fuels. That uh, winglet uh, came from NASA uh, many years ago. So that's just one uh, very visible example of uh, NASA's contribution. And uh, in 2013, Administrator Bolden announced our new and uh, exciting uh, uh, vision and strategy for NASA aeronautics to ensure uh, the next 100 years of research excellence, as we have been doing for the past 100 years uh, from NACA days through uh, NASA, as well as help maintain U.S. global leadership in aerospace industry in the face of growing international competition uh, and support aviation's key role in our nation's economy. As a bold step in advancing this vision, the President has requested $10.6 billion over uh, next 10 years for NASA Aeronautics, and that is that uh, $3.7 uh, billion increase uh, that Charlie mentioned, and starting with uh, $790 million in FY17. So I would say uh, we are at the right place, at the right time, with the right technologies. This 10-year budget plan will allow us to accelerate our work to transform aviation, to achieve revolutionary breakthroughs in aircraft and also air traffic management technologies, and improve uh, aviation's efficiency and safety, while at the same time dramatically reducing fuel consumption, emissions, and noise. With this strong support, we'll be able to develop and demonstrate 
uh, in flight a wide range of advanced technologies through a series of X-planes, uh, as we are calling uh, New Aviation Horizons. And this quest is uh, the, one of the, those X-planes that we would like to uh, design and build and fly. With what we learn from Quest, we can influence changing the current regulation that bans supersonic, commercial supersonic flight over land. Uh, that is a very strict uh, regulation, international standard. Uh, and we like to help US industry open up an entirely new market that could mean additional high paying and high quality jobs. And there will be a series of subsonic demonstrators uh, that will look very unconventional. And as you can see, some of the uh, desktop models and uh, four-foot uh, model here, um, if you have, have seen this kind of uh, uh, airplanes, um, uh, just give us a call that I'd like to get on those airplanes now. But uh, these are our concept uh, airplanes that we've been working on uh, many years. So as you can see, this is a complete departure from a uh, tube and wing, conventional tube and wing uh, aircraft shape. So with what we learn from these subsonic demonstrators, we can achieve a future where commercial flight uses only half of the fuel uh, that uh, state-of-the-art aircraft uses now, and also a quarter of nitrogen oxide uh, uh, compared with today's state-of-the-art commercial airplane. And uh, very importantly for local community, uh, this kind of technology will keep uh, its uh, takeoff and landing noise well within the uh, boundary of the airport. We'll continue learning more about the benefits of using alternative jet fuels or engine combustors that can operate on more than one type of fuel, um, any kinds of uh, alternative fuels or biofuels, or aircraft that are powered by hybrid electric systems. I like to use this analogy. Uh, if you look out the window, that uh, uh, marvelous modern uh, engineering wonder that we call airplanes, with that, with the new Aviation Horizons X planes, we will free the beautiful uh, butterfly stuck in that configuration. And we'll, we'll free uh, that uh, beautiful butterfly to fly greener, uh, safer, and faster. We'll be able to achieve the full potential of revolutionary technologies and designs that lift aviation to the next level of flying greener, safer, quieter, and faster. And it will, will up the game to a completely new level. I mentioned our workforce at the beginning of my remarks. There is a very powerful human element in this ambitious 10 years uh, plan as well. As Charlie also mentioned, just imagine uh, how much uh, inspiration we can bring to next generation of engineers and scientists um, as they watch uh, these very unconventional looking X-planes flying around the country. In addition to new av aviation horizons, the 10-year investment also will expand our ability to accelerate uh, the safe and more efficient air traffic management that accommodating, uh, that accommodate growing demand and growing uh, a variety of aircraft. Now in closing, um, this opportunity didn't happen overnight. We're at this point today because we've made significant technical progress since 2008 timeframe. Administrator Bolden mentioned that commercial airlines could save over uh, $200 billion uh, in fuel consumption uh, through 2050. That is the one clear example of uh, NASA green aviation technologies that we have worked to benefit our nation's aviation industry and national economy. This kind of uh, research result is a great example of what can be done when a robust government investment combined with a collaborative public-private partnership. And that's why I'm very thankful that I see many uh, colleagues and friends from our industry partners uh, present here today, because we couldn't have done this uh, uh, amazing advances of technology without uh, industry partners. So this is our moonshot. 
NASA Aeronautics is ready and able to take on this exciting challenge on behalf of the nation and the flying public. We are indeed at the right place at the right time with the right technologies. So as I mentioned, public-private partnership is an essential part of uh, our success. So I'm very pre pleased that Mr. David Murcher, uh, President and CEO of Aviation Industries Association is present uh, with us. So, Mr. Melcher. Well, I first want to say thank you to Administrator Bolton and uh, Dr. Shin for having me here today. Uh, there's a lot to be excited about today, uh, not only in the ideas that have been presented, but in the potential that they represent for the future. And ladies and gentlemen, I represent, uh, as was mentioned, Aerospace Industries Association, which has been around uh, 100 years uh, in 2019 and was formed by Orville Wright and Glenn Curtis and represents about 300 plus aerospace and defense companies. And I'm delighted to be here in order to support NASA's new 10-year plan to significantly boost national investments in cutting edge technologies, which you've heard a bit about, and aeronautics research. And as Charlie said, and as often want to say, this is a big deal, and we ought to really care about it. You should make no mistake about it when it comes to examples of public investments that set the gold standard for performance and public benefit, NASA's aeronautics research, in my mind, tops that list. It makes tremendous sense to continue making smart investments through NASA in an aviation safety and mobility, energy efficiency, and advanced propulsion system transformation. This budget will allow those kind of investments to be made and will make our country better. Better for technology, better for industry, better for the flying public that we see around us. We have a tremendous aviation infrastructure today, but demand for aviation services continues to grow. One estimate alone estimates a near doubling in the amount of passengers that are traveling between now and 2034, up to seven billion worldwide. And so I think it's really incumbent upon NASA that has always been a partner in advancing aviation technologies to be an important part of that future. Throughout NASA's history and that of its predecessor organization, founded 101 years ago, a little older than us, uh, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the government has performed a vital role in advancing progress on complex issues like wind shear, icing, electronic controls in cockpits, and bringing unmanned aircraft systems into the airspace. You name it, NASA was and is integral to the technologies that have advanced in each one of these areas and to conquer complex and prob uh, problematic issues. This research hasn't been done alone. It's been done with the active support and financial commitment from industry and has benefited the entire aviation community. Through NASA's exciting new Aviation Horizons initiative, the agency that pioneered hypersonic flight will help us aim at revolutionary, not evolutionary, changes in the way people fly around the world. One of our association's great member companies, Boeing, has a terrific advertisement playing in its centennial year that envisions passengers in the year 2116 circumnavigating the globe in two hours. With a strong commitment to this type of research going forward, I think it's only a question of how soon, not whether, this bold vision can be achieved. And I join also in congratulating Lockheed Martin and GE Aviation for the contract here uh, to advance the you know, low boom supersonic uh, flight because I think that's also a great accomplishment and will be a great contributor to our nation's commerce going forward. So NASA's 10-year aviation plan will build upon this great work. It will continue the kind of efforts that this nation ought to continue. And you know, I always believe in the power of ideas. And budgets follow sometimes the power of ideas. These are powerful ideas that benefit not only the flying public, but also the technology that one would expect from American and American industry. And so I lend my full support to this. Our member companies will lend their full support to this. And I think that this is something that hopefully those of you in attendance and those on Capitol Hill will also realize is very important to our flying future. So thank you for allowing me to be here today. Thank you, David. Uh, we're going to open up the question and answer session right now. We have a microphone here in the center of the room. 
We'd like uh, media reporters to step up in an orderly fashion, identify themselves, their media affiliation, and if they could, tailor their question to a specific uh, panelist so we know who they're talking, asking their question of. And with that, we'll get started. Gentlemen. Uh, hi, this is uh, Eric Neeler at Discovery News. Um, I love airplanes, and this is wonderful. It looks like something out of Johnny Quest. What I'm curious about is how the flying public is going to benefit here. Um, flying is, is not a lot of fun. It's cramped, uh, tired. It's a real challenge for a lot of passengers. So granted, the airline industry is going to save a lot of money and get to fly faster, but how is the public going to benefit here? I think if I give you the example of the, of the 787, um, you know, it, it's potentially not as cramped as most other airplanes are. The biggest benefit you get is that it's an all-composite airframe, which allows you to, the air, airline companies to put more oxygen, more air into the cockpit. So most people who fly on a 787 recognize the fact that they're a little bit more they're a little bit more rested when they get to their destinations as a result of having flown at a little bit uh, you know, lower altitude in, in the cockpit and also with more oxygen. So I think it's those kinds of things that we're endeavoring to bring to the, to the flying public. Safer flight, faster flight, cleaner, more efficient flight uh, so that it makes it easier for them to get where they want to go a lot quicker and they have less time to worry about being cramped. Tracy Watson, USA Today, for the administrator first. What happens if Congress does not allocate you the money for this particular yep. line item? What, uh, we, can you carry forward another yeah. way? And what kind of sound reduction will you achieve on the ground with this plane? Thanks. Tracy, let me, let me just give you one thing, and it's, it's the way our government works. And you, you posed the great question and the reason that, that we have been working diligently with the Congress since we rolled out the President's budget. I think everybody knows that the saying is the President proposes and the Congress disposes. So as Dave said, David said in his remarks, it is now up to the Congress to see the wisdom of what we have proposed and to see the benefit that this will bring to the flying public, to American industry, to the economy, uh, just to the security of American citizens because more and better jobs are available. So that's the, that's the key part, the key message that we're hoping that you all will help us get to the Congress in terms of what we see is a level of dissipation of the spike, if you will, the, the amount of boom. We hope it'll be no boom, but a rumble. Uh, I'm gonna see if Jaywan or somebody else wants to, wants to try to give you something, but I, I think the, the, the short answer is, that's why we're building a demonstrator. You know, the theory says one thing, we wanna see if it really works that way. You wanna comment? No, I, I think that that's a really good point, Charlie, and I just wanna add a um, couple other points that we are concentrating on uh, explains for the purpose of uh, this uh, press conference. But uh, we have been working on also uh, a lot of air traffic management and safety technologies. As an example, we've been uh, working with Charlotte uh, Airport and also American Airlines and many other partners, uh, close uh, collaboration with FAA to improve surface management and also uh, uh, more, more efficient takeoff and landing uh, processes uh, around the very heavy and, and busy terminal area. So you all you ask about the uh, benefits to public, flying public, uh, that type, type of uh, research and technology transfer to uh, uh, airports and airlines will be able to uh, certainly uh, help on-time departure and also reduce the delays and the dreadful, you, you got to the uh, airport uh, 20 minutes earlier and your gate is not open, so you, you have to sit on tarmac for 20 minutes. We will el eliminate those uh, uh, cumbersome uh, practices. So that's, that's one other part of our aeronautics research, and with this uh, funding increase, we'll be able to accelerate that kind of research as well. And in terms of uh, uh, aircraft uh, uh, capabilities, if you really think about this, uh, uh, again, bringing that butterfly out of the cocoon, then it provides a lot of flexibility for aircraft designers in uh, the seating arrangement or the number of aisles and how to design the cabin. So I think uh, uh, all in all, that uh, Charlie talked about that uh, more oxygen pump, pumped into um, fuselage today in 787, that's an that's a immediate benefit from uh, composite research that NASA has uh, collaborated with industry. So, now the next stage of opening up uh, this configuration constraint, uh, we believe we will make uh, flight a lot more 
uh, enjoyable and because we can provide that flexibility and versatility for designers to free up their constraints. So in all uh, sense, I think uh, we can provide a lot more benefit to flying public. Hi, I'm uh, <clears throat> Mark Selinger, uh, Aerospace America Magazine. Can you um, explain a little bit more about how you arrived at this uh, particular uh, concept and, co and contract? Was there a competition or is this an outgrowth of work that you've already been doing with Lockheed? And also, what's kind of the next step after they do the preliminary design? Are there options for additional contracts and activities? Thanks. Okay, um, thanks for the question. So um, this so-called low boom uh, design has been worked for uh, many years. And actually, I want to uh, introduce Peter Cohen, uh, sitting, standing back there, tall guy. <laughs> He's the project manager who's uh, responsible for uh, low boom research. Uh, over the years. So this is by design. Design of the aircraft uh, uh, produces uh, uh, less intensity uh, shock, so people on the ground uh, will not be uh, annoyed or bothered by a uh, boom level. So this, this is not a, uh, through some gimmicky flight maneuvers or some uh, uh, artifacts uh, hoping that we'll reduce sonic boom. So this is real science. But uh, how we got here, uh, uh, Peter led uh, his team for the, again, past several years, focusing on uh, low boom research through ground testing and also working with the community uh, to measure community's response. So we actually flew a uh, uh, simulated uh, uh, boom generating uh, flights and asked uh, public on the ground, how, how did you uh, feel about that or did you sense that? and um, a, a lot of numerical anal analysis, so uh, just tremendous amount of research has gone into that. And how did uh, Lockheed Martin um, uh, ended up winning the award? We uh, certainly had a, a open competition, and um, the Lockheed uh, Martin's uh, design uh, uh, appeared to be the, the best value for the government. So that's why we selected uh, Lockheed Martin, and again, congratulations on that award uh, winning. But um, this is our uh, strength of our industry, that we have worked with industry uh, partners together to get here. And then when we send out that type of uh, uh, solicitation, our strong industry uh, partners respond. And this is a marvelous design that uh, uh, one day we'll be able to open up to uh, flying public to enjoy, again, supersonic flight. So just imagine, just one last comment, just imagine uh, you, you go anywhere in the world, less than six hours uh, flying uh, a supersonic uh, jetliner. And uh, we owe to our uh, children, the next generation, that type of uh, a breakthrough uh, from the aviation. Preliminary design will go on about 17 months, and then uh, we'll go through another full and open competition and select the, uh, uh, the, the best industry partner or perhaps partners. Um, and then um, the design and build, actual detailed design and build phase, we are estimating about four to five years. And then uh, we will go through flight tests to acquire the scientific data to uh, uh, work with the regulatory agencies after that. Flight testing in the early 20s? Yes. And before you, before you ask your question, I, you keep stay right up there. I I don't want to I don't want to pass up the opportunity to thank David Melcher and AIA for all that they've done through the years. Um, you know, we keep talking about NASA industry or government industry uh, partnership. It, that's that's really what we mean. You know, I think three or four years ago, you didn't hear anybody talking about NASA's aeronautics budget, and it was not until you know, David's predecessor, Marion Blakey, and now David, and AIA, and our other industry partners began to talk to members of the Congress about the critical importance of, of getting up to speed so that we maintain our technological leadership in the world, in the field of aeronautics. Um, it's one thing for us to say it. It's another thing for industry to go in and say, you know, the ideas they have, they're really sound, and we can make it happen. And because we generally don't build. You know, we come up with the concepts and then we partner with industry 
because they're the ones that do the physical building and, and carry these concepts into reality. So I, I, I just wanted to say thanks for that. Can I make a quick comment? You sure can. Um, you know, speaking as a, a former CEO of an aerospace and defense company uh, who came to AIA, you know, industry wants to invest in technologies for the future. But what industry is always looking for is a bit of a roadmap that tells you what is the target, where are we trying to go, what technologies are important. And so when you're, when you're deciding on how to invest in a company, you're not just throwing darts at a wall with no dartboard. You know, you want to understand where does the nation want to go, where would our investment potentially bring a return. And I'll take, uh, I'll take my hat off to NASA and uh, Dr. Shin for creating a 10-year plan that has a ton of rigor to it you know, that, that actually establishes those goals and those technologies that are desirable, and industry will follow and be great partners with the government when you have that kind of a plan, a very detailed, very well thought through one. And uh, so I think that that's something to be, uh, you know, congratulated. Administrator. David Curley from ABC News. Uh, this is one project. It's a 10-year project. You have a longer vision. Actually, the poster here says it, what you expect flying to be like. Your grandchildren, what will flight be like for them on an aircraft? You, you, know, you know how to ask me. I have three granddaughters. I am the very proud father of three beautiful granddaughters. My son lives with, in a house full of women. Even the dog's a girl. So uh, he's in bad shape. You know, he, he's surrounded by women. But the middle granddaughter, the 13-year-old, wants to be a Marine Corps fighter pilot. And so what I see her flying is something that's going to be uh, even more advanced than, than what we're working on today. Um, it will be integrated with, uh, with robotic systems. Uh, you know, she may be flying with, a, with a, an autonomous airplane on her wing, or she may be flying behind an autonomously powered or piloted vehicle. But that's the, that's the wave of the future. Um, I really do see them flying on aircraft, like Jaywan said, that can go any place in the world in under six hours. Going back to the question about what for the for the traveling public, or you were talking about comfort. Um, just think about it. When you're on a 13-hour trip, uh, even the most comfortable airplanes that I've been in, it turns into an airplane after, after about six hours. Um, so I think just by getting flight time down, it's like sending people to Mars when we talk about that. The thing we want to do is make game-changing developments in in-space propulsion so we can shorten the time of transit. And that's, that's what's really important. So I think we're going to find that my granddaughters are going places much faster. Uh, they're going places and much quieter for the public underneath and for the people in the airplane, much more comfortable where they arrive wherever their destination is and they're feeling a lot better than, than sometimes they feel today. And then the other thing is it's probably not going to cost a fortune because we're really going to get the cost of flying down. I, it, that, that would be my, my ultimate hope also. Much greener, as a matter of fact. And we're already seeing that, you know, whether it's using newer types of fuels, biofuels, but also just in the engine design and in ensuring that what they put out is cleaner than what, what was put out last year. And each year is an incremental change, I hope. Hi, my name is Julia Bacano. You can pull that down. <laughs> I'll just leave it. I don't want That's to. That's all right. It. We can uh, hear you though. Okay. There we go. My name is Julia with CBS News. Thank you so much for hosting this. Um, how does this does this technology come at a, as at a cost to consumers? Because it seems right now in the aviation industry that a lot of consumers are concerned about pricing, um, increasing prices, and it seems that um, a lot of airlines are downgrading and making spaces smaller. I think. A couple of days ago, I saw that airplanes were trying to put seats backwards yeah. and things like that. So I was just wondering, um, how does this affect the consumer in terms of pricing? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer to somebody else after I give it a guess, OK? <laughs> I think one of the things is it, I think you will find a great benefit to the consumer because, again, as I said, shorter transit times, um, more competition, actually, when you get there. And there's nothing like competition to drive the price down. Um, so I see those kinds of things working. I don't think the, the general aviation consumer will see any effect just yet because this is a government, industry, a, a government industry partnership where we're putting up a significant portion of the expense. So they've already paid for that in their taxpayer dollars. And what we're trying to do is actually put the taxpayers' dollars to work in the most efficient and effective manner that, that, we, we, that we can find. 
uh, for them. So I, I think in the long term, it's going to be a great benefit to the consumer. I don't know whether anybody else wants to. Yeah, just one quick point. Um, one of the reasons why airlines are getting really stingy on everything uh, is because their fuel cost uh, takes up about one third, nominally one third of their uh, total operating costs. That, that's sort of a, a, on the average, uh, industry-wide average. So uh, that's a huge uh, cost item for airlines. That's why m many of these uh, uh, concepts, we're going after 50% or more of our fuel consumption reduction. So by the, by the time we actually implement these technologies in industries, that uh, uh, our strong U.S. industry is turning into these concepts and technologies to product and actually save 50% or more fuel consumption, I think uh, our uh, airlines will return some of those profits back to flying public. Uh, Zach Rosenberg, Air and Space Magazine. Uh, first question is for Dr. Shin. Uh, you're surrounded by a number of concepts, illustrations, and models. I'm wondering why this is the concept that you guys decided to unveil today and what the timeline is for speaking about the rest of them. Uh, second question is for General Bolden. Uh, General, can you just elaborate a little bit on uh, what made the difference in between the FY16 and FY17 requests for, um, for aeronautics? <laughs> De development and uh, uh, introduction into uh, actual market uh, in the aviation business, it, it takes some takes some time. So uh, some uh, uh, people say about 15 years or 20 years between somewhere between there. Uh, the reason why is again it, it's a really high tech industry and fairly capital in, uh, intensive industry. So and then safety is paramount. So you don't you don't do anything to jeopardize safety. So uh, when you put all those factors in, it takes a fairly long time. So that's one of the reasons why uh, public-private partnership for the country is so critically important that uh, NASA Aeronautics does uh, uh, technologies for 15, 20 years out. So we are not working on any near-term technologies. While our uh, US aviation industry is, is doing great job in uh, leading the global market, aviation market. Government can uh, make a smart investment to uh, work on next generation technologies. So when industry sees the market opportunity based on their business case and business models, then uh, those promising technologies are ready for industry to take on. So that, that's our strategy and it has been worked out uh, very well. Well, we, we can only uh, uh, talk about what NASA can actually do. So uh, we are trying to, with the full funding that President requested, that we can actually do several uh, uh, flight demonstrators and design and build and start flying uh, during 20, early 2020 time frame. And then um, that's, that's anywhere between 10 and 15 years out. And then uh, I, we will continue to work with U.S. industry to uh, introduce these benefits and technologies. And then uh, you, you can guess, depending on the market uh, condition, uh, U.S. companies will decide uh, when to enter the market. And in response to the second part of your question, patience and persistence. Uh, the question was, what's the difference between the 2016 budget and the 2017 budget levels? Um, it is the result of knowing that you can't go for everything all at once and the fact that you've got to be able to demonstrate to people that when you make a promise, you're going to deliver. You're going to deliver hopefully on time and on cost. And I think uh, Jay Wan mentioned we rolled out the new strategic plan for aeronautics in 2013. Yeah. Um, and we started talking about, uh, you know, the plan that we wanted to put in place. David Melcher talked about industry being willing to follow as long as there is a, a concrete plan in place with details that people who are pretty sharp can follow because they don't want to throw away good money after bad. And it just took us the time to get there. The, the, and probably the, the biggest thing was, um, um, you know, I got, I'm an aviator. I'm a pilot. And so I came to NASA to try to reinstill some vigor into the aeronautics mission directorate. But every year, my first few years, 
you have, you know, you've got to prioritize stuff. And, and so aeronautics just always stayed right at the same level it was. And then when I started going in, talking to Congress more and more, they said, hey, you didn't ask for it. So I said, oh, okay, if that's all I got to do, uh, I can handle that. And, and, it, and it sounds trivial, but we made a very conscious decision and we, we talked to the leadership of the agency and we said, look, uh, this agency has led the nation for 100 years, first as NACA and now as NASA. Uh, we have made the nation number one in the field of aeronautics. You know, when the Wright brothers invented the airplane, uh, America walked away from airplanes for about 15 years. NACA came about in, 20, in 1915 because the Wright brothers could not get an American company to buy an airplane. They couldn't get the U.S. Army Air Corps to buy an airplane and the Europeans started building airplanes and improving on the airplane and we woke up. Uh, you know, it took us 12 years to wake up and NACA was formed just as NASA was formed to transition NACA to space when we were awakened by something that, that threatened our leadership. Um, we just don't want to find ourselves there again and so we decided that the best thing for NASA to do was exert its leadership and its influence I consider myself to be the president and the Congress's uh, number one advisor on civil aeronautics and space. They may not look at me that way, but I've got some incredibly brilliant engineers and scientists and people who advise me to advise the president and the Congress. And we generally think when we thought something through and we take it to them, if they choose to follow us, we're going to end up in pretty good shape. So this was a long time in coming. This is, you know, we started this back in 2013. And that's what makes today such a big day. The, the, I, I, my hat's off to the folk in aeronautics for being patient and you know, allowing me to be patient and learn. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have to come to a close here pretty soon, so maybe one more question. I do have several folks here that can give you more details once we officially end. So anyone else? Uh, hi, Mark Selinger, Aerospace America again. Um, can you explain how this uh, quest will achieve the low boom without getting too technical? And I mean, is it, is it certain features of the design and also how it compares to previous efforts to achieve um, supersonic, including the Concord, which I know wasn't that quiet, and, and some US efforts as well. Are you Thank you. Going to that when you go down? Are you going to yeah. Uh, I can just really give you a quick answer, but uh, this is a great uh, segue. If you all uh, uh, come down, I think it's uh, downstairs, uh, we're going to have another uh, hour of really detailed uh, Q&A session. So I, we can better answer that uh, uh, during next session. But very quickly, again, I, I emphasize the des design. So uh, you, you see the long and very pointy nose. So that will actually, that's the design feature uh, for this uh, low boom supersonic airplane. And years of research revealed or taught us that you have to have a slender and long nose, but uh, it presents a lot of challenges. So um, we, we have overcome a lot of our technical challenges to uh, fly that type of uh, shape of aircraft. So let me, let me just give you that as a teaser. <laughs> and uh, in the next hour or so, uh, please come join us and uh, uh, learn more about what we mean by five demonstrators or six demonstrators and what we're trying to do uh, over the next 10 years. Appreciate it, Charlie. Uh, and that's going to do it for our news conference today. I'd like to thank our panelists, Charlie, uh, Jaywan, and David, for joining us today. Um, I have a colleague over here that has press kits for the media. Uh, any that we have remaining after the media get their, uh, get their copy of it, then we can give it to other people. Uh, if you'd like more information about this, uh, about NASA aeronautics programs, join us on the web at www.nasa.gov slash aeronautics. And for more information about any of NASA's various programs and projects, you can join us at www.nasa.gov or among any of our many social media products. And with that, thanks for joining us today. Have a great day.